Hello and welcome to Still Behind the Bench. My name is Adam and on this channel I'll attempt to describe the science behind distilling spirits in a more technical way. Hopefully it'll whet your appetite to learn more and teach you enough so that you're more self-sufficient. So for this video I'm going to talk about acetyl, acetoin, and 2,3-butane diol. But it's mainly about diacetyl, about what it is and what conditions are needed to increase the amounts or decrease the amounts. So let's get started. All right, so I'm going to talk briefly about the pronunciation of these compounds because I've seen them mispronounced all over the place, even by college and university professors. Um, then I'm going to talk about precursors and how they're created so we can understand why diacetyl is being produced in the first place. Then we'll get into the aspects of controlling its production. So, pronunciation. Diacetyl, this is pronounced diacetyl. Why is that? Um, it's because diacetyl is made up of two acetyl moieties, and I'll get into what moieties are in a bit. But an acetyl moiety is a radical of acetic acid. So what do I mean by that? Because this uh, oxygen here isn't attached to anything, that means it's very reactive. So they, they would call this a radical because it has that very reactive oxygen on it. So we have our acetic acid here. You can see how they're very close, just this uh, OH group. This hydroxyl group has been taken off the end. So you get this as the structural formula for acetyl. Since acetyl deri is derived from acetic acid, this the way we pronounce it, acetic, is how, or I should say, is the, the root way you would pronounce all these other compounds that are derived from it. Acetic acid, acetyl, diacetyl, uh, acetaldehyde is another one. So yeah, you put two of these together and you get your diacetyl. Now, there's also a diacetyl, an actual compound called diacetyl. It's made up of two acetyl functional groups. I'm not going to go into what this is or anything because you'll probably rarely see it, but there is a compound called diacetyl. So when you are talking about this, but you're pronouncing it this way, somebody might confuse what you're saying and assume you're talking about this instead. And they're very different compounds. So uh, note on what a moiety is. So we have our ethanol molecule here. We have our alcohol functional group called a hydroxyl, and then we have this CH3CH2 portion. So you can, since you group this as a the functional group here, you can group the rest of this molecule and call it a moiety. So a moiety is essentially just a subunit of a molecule, and if it shows up in a lot of different places, or a lot of different molecules, they'll call it a moiety. In this case, they call it an ethyl moiety. So if you join an ethyl moiety and a hydroxyl, you get ethanol. So now we can talk about the other major compounds that are going to be present around the same time as diacetyl. Okay, so the other major compounds that are present within this sphere of uh, relationships are pyruvate, alpha-acetolactate or alpha-acetolactic acid, acetoin, 2,3-butane diol, and then diacetyl, of course. Now, these last three have what you would consider a buttery flavor. In fact, they are what gives butter its flavor. It's also what companies use for fake butter flavoring. So, you know, if you buy pre-buttered popcorn, like Orville Redenbacher's popcorn, and you look on the package, you'll probably see diacetyl and acetoin listed as ingredients, and it's the butter flavor they've put into it. So with that said, both acetoin and 2,3-butane diol have much higher flavor thresholds, meaning you need to have a much higher concentration of those compounds in order to get these flavors to show up in your beverage. Whereas diacetyl is much, much lower, or sorry, has a much, much lower flavor threshold. So depending on what else is present, diacetyl's flavor threshold can be as low as 30 parts per billion. So that'd be 30 micrograms per liter. Although when you put it in an alcohol, that threshold usually goes up to around 100 parts per billion. So 100 micrograms per liter. That's an exceptionally small amount. Whereas acetoin is 50 parts per million, so that'd be 50 milligrams per liter needs to be present. And then 2,3-butane diol is between 60 and 150 parts per million. So this diacetyl is 500 times more detectable than acetoin or butane diol. So if you have it in your beverage, you'll never know exactly how much is in there unless you test for it. It's actually quite easy to taste it. It makes up a big part of what's called your the organoleptic profile of your beverage. 
And if you've never heard the term organoleptic before, that just means using your senses to analyze. So, you know, taste, smell, sight, they all play a role in your objective and subjective experience of whatever it is you're analyzing. So let's get to the, the nitty gritty of how diacetyl is actually created. Okay, so pyruvate is the compound that starts this all off. It's produced via the glycolytic pathway, glycolysis. I described that pathway in episode 10, fermentation part one. I'll link to it in the description and I'll put a card at the top of the video for it. Essentially, you go from whatever source of fermentable sugar you have present in the wort or must, you know, glucose, fructose, maltose, etc., and you end up with pyruvate. Under anaerobic conditions, that pyruvate normally gets turned into ethanol. And then under aerobic conditions, it gets used up in the Krebs cycle, aka the citric acid cycle. However, Pyruvate is used in three other metabolic pathways, or I should say at least three other metabolic pathways to make specific amino acids. But I'm only going to reference two of them, valine and leucine, because the precursor to the third one, isoleucine, isn't involved in the creation of diacetyl. So the first step is that two molecules of pyruvate get turned into alpha-acetolactate by an enzyme called acetolactate synthase. So if the amino acids are needed, these will get shunt shunted off to the metabolic pathways to create valine or leucine. But what can happen is that alpha-acetolactate can spontaneously turn into diacetyl. It just happens. The yeast isn't creating it on purpose. Uh, for lack of a better word, it has no real awareness that it's being created at this point. But if the yeast doesn't immediately turn that diacetyl back into pyruvate to use for energy, or the diacetyl isn't turned into acetoin via diacetyl reductase, then it will expel that diacetyl out of the cell. And that's the main way you end up with diacetyl in your wash. The other way would be that, you know, the diacetyl is present in the side of the cell when the cell dies and it breaks apart, releasing it into the wash. One other thing that can happen though is that this alpha acetolactate can meet up with acetolactate decarboxylase, an enzyme, and turn directly into acetoin. And then the acetoin, either created via the diacetyl pathway or direct to the acetoin pathway, can meet up with a butane dehydrogenase enzyme and turn into 2,3-butane diol. But yeah, when I learned that diacetyl was just spontaneous created, I was actually quite surprised because I thought it was it would have to be something that the yeast is intentionally doing but it's not and that's how it ends up in your wash. As for these other two compounds uh, I couldn't really find much on why they're created especially 2,3-butane diol. A lot of organisms have the, uh, the metabolic pathway to create 2,3-butane diol but no one seems to know why it's produced yet. So let's talk about uh, controlling production of diacetyl. But before I do that I'd like to thank my Patreons for supporting my channel specifically Chris Turner, thank you very much for uh, all the assistance you give. Okay, so let's talk about controlling production of diacetyl since it's the main compound in this discussion that you want to prevent or create more of, and there are a bunch of ways. The easiest way to prevent its production is to simply buy acetolactate decarboxylase enzyme. What it does is it breaks down alpha acetolactate, or I should say it turns it into acetoin. So if there is no alpha acetolactate present, it can't spontaneously turn into diacetyl, right? Realistically, I doubt many of us are going to be doing this. Uh, maybe if you're making a beer or wine, or otherwise you're having very severe diacetyl issues, you may want to go this route, but I imagine it's expensive. Um, I found one company, BSG Craft and Brewing, that sells it, but they're a distributor, so they don't have any prices, but you can find out who their retailers are and buy it through them. The second easy way is to add specific nutrients to prevent the production of diacetyl. Specifically, if you add valine or leucine, and particularly L-valine or L-leucine, because that's usually how you're gonna buy it. If you create, or if you add these two amino acids, then the yeast won't need to produce them in the first place. And in fact, L-valine even has a suppression mechanism, or I should say L-valine triggers a suppression mechanism in the yeast to not produce acetolactate synthase when there's a sufficient amount of valine present so that alpha, so the pyruvate doesn't get turned into alpha acetolactate in the first place. Again, this is probably going to be a pricey choice. So these are the other main control methods, uh, oxygenation and pitching rate, flocculation type and fermentation time, temperature and pH, and I'm gonna go into detail in these. But these are all controls outside of specially bred or, you know, 
genetically modified yeast that are meant to be low producers of diacetyl in the first place. So I'm going to talk about oxygenation and pitching rate first. You may have heard that oxygenation plays a role in the creation of diacetyl, and it does, but it's not because it's doing any sort of oxidation reaction. If you have high oxygenation and you pitch a low quantity of yeast, you will have a lot of new cell growth, which will require the production of a lot of valine and leucine amino acids, right? That means a lot of alpha acetolactate is going to be produced, and if more of it exists, then more of it can spontaneously turn into diacetyl. So high oxygenation in combination with a low pitching rate can lead to a high diacetyl concentrations, and the opposite, low oxygenation and a high pitching rate can lead to low diacetyl concentration. It has nothing to do with the oxidation of acetoin into diacetyl. That doesn't happen. I can post a link to a study where they actually tested for that and they showed that it doesn't happen. But, you know, I only mentioned that oxidation thing because I've seen it mentioned in other forums before. But no, the reason is, is because you're producing more yeast cells and those yeast cells need more amino acids. All right, so flocculation type and fermentation time. When the sugars start to run out near the end of a fermentation, the yeast will lo be looking for more sources of energy. It has already dumped a bunch of diacetyl into the wash. So if the yeast is a low or medium flocculating yeast, meaning it doesn't clump easily and it doesn't settle easily, which is a pain in the ass when you want to clarify, if it is a low or medium flocculating type yeast, then it'll still be sticking around after the fermentation ends and it can more easily eat up all that free diacetyl flowing around in your wash, converting it back into pyruvate and then using it for whatever it needs it for, maybe producing more ethanol. But if you have a high flocculating yeast, this typically won't have happen enough because it all clumps together and settles at the bottom too quickly. And so you end up with more free diacetyl in the wash. This is also where fermentation time comes into play because the more time the yeast has in contact with that free diacetyl in the wash, the more it will uptake and remove it from the wash. So a high flocculating yeast and a short fermentation time will lead to more diacetyl, higher diacetyl levels. A low or medium flocculating yeast with long fermentation times or even taking a few days after fermentation ends just to let it use up that diacetyl in the brewing world it's called a diacetyl rest that will lead to lower or even no diacetyl level this is where clarifying and filtering can come into play as well if you remove the yeast while the diacetyl levels are still high you the yeast can't obviously remove any more diacetyl and so the levels will say high if you're having a problem with diacetyl like if fermentation is stopped and you taste your wash and it has a buttery flavor to it give it a couple of days and taste it again and you may find that that flavor is gone. All right, so now we have temperature. Temperature works in two different ways. A simpler of the two ways is that a higher temperature simply increases the rate at which the spontaneous conversion of alpha acetolactate happens. And uh, so yeah, higher temperatures means higher uh, reaction kinetics, so more of it will convert. The more complex process related to temperature is that higher temperatures usually lead to greater cell turnover. So more yeast cells die, meaning more yeast cells are created. And when those new cells are created, the amino acid valine needs to be created for its proteins. And so more alpha acetolactate is created. However, you can tweak this last issue by lowering the temperature near the end of the fermentation. So you have more healthy yeast around when fermentation is coming towards an end uh, and they will start taking uptaking that diacetyl again. Some breweries will actually even increase the temperature a few days before fermentation ends and when they do their diacetyl rest. So they increase the temperature to increase the number of cells that are present and they'll add a bit more something like a dry malt extract or a liquid malt extract or even a sugar just a little bit just to bring up the number of yeast cells and then they bring the temperature back down again as the fermentation ends to slow the cell the rate of cell turnover so they can then remove the diacetyl during that diacetyl rest that they give it. Higher temperatures lead to more uh, spontaneous conversion of alpha acetolactate into diacetyl and it also causes more cells to or yeast cells to die meaning more cells need to be created meaning more valine needs to be created and so there's more alpha acetolactate more alpha acetolactate gets turned into more diacetyl. That's temperature. Now pH is actually one of the easier things to explain in a sort of hand wavy way because I couldn't find the reason why pH plays a role. But the simple truth of it seems to be that diketones, uh, of which diacetyl is, so diacetyl is called a, a, a vicinal 
diketone, right? And what that means is adjacent uh, ketone. So vicinal just means adjacent. And I'll here, I'll draw it out again. Yep. So you can see essentially here you have So these are the ketone groups. You have two of them and they're adjacent to each other. That's it, adjacent to ketones. So it turns out that uh, vicinal diketones or diketones in general, they form more quickly under acidic conditions. Uh, I'm not sure why this is the case. Spent about a day trying to find out why, but uh, you know, I can only do so much research before I need to move on with the next talk. But yeah, the case is that the lower the pH value, the higher the rate of diacetyl formation. And so if you let your pH drop lower and lower and lower, there's a greater chance you'll get more diacetyl ending up in your water. Uh, so this is, all, this is all a lot to take in and it would be kind of complex, but not super complex to plan out a fermentation that takes most of these things into account in order to raise or lower the amounts of di uh, diacetyl. But generally speaking, if you want a lot of diacetyl, you want to ferment at a higher temperature, you want to pitch a low amount of yeast, you want a lot of oxygenation, and you're going to use DAP as your nitrogen source. Create a buffer that holds the pH at a lower or more acidic value. Then when you're close to the end of fermentation, but not quite finished, cold crash it or filter it or clarify it before fermentation actually ends, and you should maximize diacetyl concentration. If you want to do the opposite and limit it, ferment at a lower temperature, pitch with more yeast, use a yeast that has a low to moderate flocculation type. Don't over oxygenate. Use a buffer that holds your pH at a higher level or uh, sorry, a higher value. Maybe add valine amino acid and or acetyl lactate decarboxylase enzyme. And then when you think the fermentation is finished, let the yeast settle naturally over a few days so it can remove any excess diacetyl. And that's essentially how you control the levels of this compound. Unfortunately, I can't tell you whether or not diacetyl is going to taste good in the beverage that you're making. I imagine in a rum or maybe small amounts in a whiskey, it could be good, but you'll have to experiment to find out. And that's it for diacetyl and other buttery compounds. I hope you learned something. Please click like and subscribe if you want to see more and have a great week.